Hello. Oh good my goodness, I saw somebody I know. <laughs> <laughs> there will be, I'm sure. John Devonshire, is that you? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, Elsie. <laughs> nice to see you again after 30 it's years. Been, yes, yes, good to see you. It's been so long. <laughs> wow. It was great to see your name and uh, hear uh, <laughs> you to talk. Elsie, we are both very well, well into retirement, thoroughly busy as we should be, and uh, touch wood at the moment, we're both well. But lovely to see you again. Oh, good to see you. <laughs> hey, and that's Ota. Hi. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm good. I've been uh, 31 years, eh? Oh, th this is wonderful. Magda, I think I'm done. I've seen enough. <laughs> Oh, no, it's not the, the end. It's just the beginning of this of this event. So <laughs> I, I am delighted to, to that there are some reunion opportunities for, for attendees today. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Magda Joshi, a member of the Philanthropy Engagement and Partnerships team at UWC Atlantic. And I'm, I'm delighted to, to welcome Elsie Fakoffman to today's uh, Atlantic Circle in Conversation event. It's an event uh, that forms part of a series of usually bi-weekly sessions that we uh, host online and I'm delighted to see some familiar faces today. Before we uh, begin uh, the event, I just wanted to highlight a few points. I uh, would like to invite you, if you can, to rename yourselves on Zoom. Uh, and identifying, if applicable, your year of graduation from the college and of, of course your name, so that we know if you're asking questions later, uh, who you are. Uh, we will be using the chat function to take questions, uh, so do feel free to post them as we move along. Uh, if you are not asking questions, kindly remain on mute and we may uh, have to mute attendees uh, on occasion, so forgive us uh, for being rude. Uh, the event is being recorded and uh, it will be available to review on the UWC Atlantic YouTube channel. Uh, today's event, uh, the title is Making an Impact in Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics Education. I'm delighted to welcome our speaker, Professor Elsie Fakoffman. Elsie graduated from the college in 1988 and is currently a visiting scholar and founding head of the newly established Department of Orthotics and Prosthetics at the University of Health and Allied Sciences in Ghana. She's also an associate professor and founding head of the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Ghana. She earned her undergraduate master's and PhD qualifications, all from the University of Pennsylvania. She joined the University of Ghana in 2001 and has contributed immensely towards the development of science education at all levels in Ghana and beyond. She is noted, uh, for example, for her contribution to the establishment of the School of Engineering Sciences as well as the development of several other academic programs at Ghana's premier university. Since 2006, she has served as host and quiz mistress at the hugely popular Ghana National Science and Mathematics Quiz TV program for senior high schools. Her, her contributions to STEM education have been recognized with several national and international awards. Elsie, we are delighted to host you on today's In, In Conversation program. Thank you, Magda, and I would like to say a very big thank you to your team that invited me to do this. I'm happy to share what I've been doing since I left AC. <laughs> thank you. Uh, today's format of the event will be more of an exchange, so I will ask Elsie a number of, of questions, but you are, of course, also welcome to, to post your questions and we'll, uh, we'll turn to you. Uh, uh, in the second half of the session. Uh, so Elsie, I know you, you've had a fascinating journey through your uh, education and professional uh, uh, career. Uh, I think that the, the starting point of our conversation would be to hear more about your childhood. I know that you left home at an early age. It would be really interesting to hear more uh, about that part of your life. Yes, so I was born in Ghana and both of my parents were teachers. 
So they were teaching in various schools. I hope you can hear me. Okay, so both of them were teachers. I was the eldest of four children. And uh, my father being an education person was very interested in making sure that I got a very good education. So I started uh, my schooling in Ghana, uh, not very big schools or anything, small schools. And then I finally wound up at a, a Rigal secondary school. And this is how everything began because that's where I got recommended to attend UWC Atlantic. Yes. So I was very small. I was always very small. And uh, I prepared some pictures to show you. So <laughs> eventually you'll get to see what I look like before I, I came to AC. <laughs> Thank you. Before we turn to your uh, experiences at, at UWC Atlantic, I also would like to uh, find out more about uh, your life uh, back when you were a high school student before moving to Wales. What were your activities like? What was your education like? All right, so we, we were in a boarding school and boarding schools are still very popular in Ghana. Most people attend boarding school at some point in their lives. And so I joined uh, the school at um, a Brigal Secondary School when I was 11, I turned 12 that year. And uh, what normally happens is everybody takes the same courses. By the time you get to your third year, you are taking about 20 courses, all sorts of courses, uh, sciences, general arts, um, business, everything. And the idea was to expose us to uh, all these subjects so that we would make a choice. Although the choice really wasn't up to us because in the end it was the teachers who chose for us what we, we, we would eventually do based on our exam results. Um, it was a typical type of education that we had, we have in Ghana. It's still very much the same. Um, so you normally have, you, you go to a class, the teacher is in charge. And in those days, we all believe the teachers knew everything. So you are not to uh, uh, query anything the teacher said. The teacher knew the answers and you basically sat obediently, listened to everything. The more you've got to memorize, the better your grades were. <laughs> and so that's the sort of uh, education I went through. With regard to practical work, we didn't really have much in terms of facilities. And so, yes, we did study. I eventually became a science student. I, I was studying science because I was one of the best on the exams that they gave us. And so if you're a good student, you wound up being a science student. So I wound up um, in the science class and we were not doing really too much in terms of experimentation or anything, but we were really good at finding information, the little information we could get. And uh, we were also very resilient. Life was not easy at all at the school. Um, the school sits on top of a hill. And so um, issues like getting water at certain times of the year were very difficult. So if you are able to graduate from this school, you were prepared really, you were basically uh, ready to survive in any difficult circumstance. And so I was taught to be resilient. Uh, I was taught to take things seriously. My father always said our education was extremely important. It was the only thing he could give us. And so we were to take our education seriously. So um, that was the kind of background that I had before I, I was recommended to attend the United World College of the Atlantic. Yes. Uh, now we'll all be, of course, very keen to hear about that transition, which for I know for uh, many. Uh, it's raining heavily here and it's hard for me to hear if you can raise your voice a bit. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Yes. Uh, it's um, it's interesting that it's it's raining because that's that's probably uh, the reminiscence of, of Wales as well. Reminder of Wales um, in terms of your transition to to the college. What were some main similarities and differences between Aburi Senior Girls High School? Can you hear me? Excuse me a moment, please. Is it any better now, Elsie? Can yes, you hear me? it's a lot better now. I can hear now. Great. We can hear you clearly. So, so that's great. All is, all is working well. Uh, 
yes, I was asking about the transition from uh, from Aburi Senior uh, Girls High School to uh, your life in Wales. What were some similarities and some differences as well? All right. So the transition was was difficult for me. I don't know if my classmates like Ota and, and others, whether they realized how difficult a time I was having. I arrived in Wales in September. And um, if people remember me, they, they would remember that I was the only one who was wearing the big winter coat in September. <laughs> I, I, I had never experienced that kind of weather. I was used to the warm Ghana weather. And so even on, during the orientation week when we went out hiking, in the mountains, I was still wearing those winter coats. <laughs> so that was one thing I had to get used to. The other thing also had to do with um, uh, basically the way the classes were organized. Uh, like I said, I was used to a more structured place where the teacher knew everything and told us everything. Uh, and here I was in this new place where I was expected to have an opinion on everything. I don't remember. Um, ever haven't been taken so seriously for having a certain opinions. So <laughs> it was not easy for me uh, to do that. Uh, for example, chemistry class that was done that I just met this <laughs> during this uh, period. Uh, we were allowed to explore. Of course, we had the topics we were covering, but chemistry was a lot of fun. I remember when we were doing uh, uh, all the analytical chemistry, and we had all these experiments with color changes and excitement. It was the first time I had seen chemistry to be that exciting. And so that was good. Um, like I said, having an opinion, even in English classes, I remember we read um, uh, Marquez, Chronicle of a Death Foretold, and we had to go to class and discuss this, and it was just amazing. The ideas that my classmates were coming up with, it wasn't just about the teacher telling us what to think. Um, there was also even physics class, one lesson. We could design our own experiments to go and run, which is, which is completely different from what I had been used to. So uh, yes, good and uh, terrifying at times. <laughs> and all those orientation activities, you know, um, the, rescue activities were terrifying to me. I am afraid of heights. And yet I was made to go get, get onto somebody's back and climb that cliff. That is an experience I'm never going to forget in my life. I still remember it till today. Um, I also remember swimming. Otta, you have to remember this one. Uh, I guess, you know, we had to do, um, the, the, we all had to know how to swim. And most of us from uh, my part of the world I came there, I had never been in a swimming pool. I had never seen any pool to know how to swim. So I had to sign up for swimming classes. And I remember standing at the pool, uh, wearing my swimsuit. I guess I looked like a swimmer. So someone pushed me there, must have been otter. <laughs> I nearly drowned that day. <laughs> I had to be rescued. <laughs> so there were just simple things that people took for granted. They were all new to me and I had to readjust my thinking to be able to do some of the things that uh, I was able to do. In addition to that, the place, you know, UWC Atlantic shaped my way of thinking. Uh, before that, I had not been really doing any service activities. It was mostly about studying and making sure I did well on my academic work. And so suddenly I had this, um, I, um, this responsibility to be involved in service, giving back to society. And this is something that I still live with now. So yes, so a lot of new things, uh, uh, some most very exciting, some terrifying. Yes, we'll, we'll definitely talk about uh, how much you've, you've been giving back to society uh, <laughs> throughout uh, some of the questions that I have prepared. And also it's interesting to hear you about your fear of heights uh, because yes. uh, you are not the one to, to say one to say no to a challenge. So, so it just <laughs> kind of briefly and really aptly I find sums up uh, your your later decisions and challenges that you've you've tackled uh, so so well. Uh, um, I I think the next stage that you that we've all uh, we know is your your move from from the college to to your next step in in your life, which was uh, your studies in in the United States. What was that transition like? Um, that was another interesting transition. 
I think uh, by that time I had met different people with different backgrounds, but you know, UWC Atlantic is an ideal place, a place full of idealism. And so I was looking for the best in everyone. And the transition really had to do with the fact that I could live in a hall, in a, a community where people really, there were some people who simply didn't want to have anything to do with me. That was a shock because <laughs> I expected everyone to be like my, my classmates and my seniors or my juniors at AC where you see a new person, you are excited, you want to meet the person, you want to learn from that person. And I went to university and it wasn't like that at all. So that, that was a, a bit of a challenge, getting used to at first. But later on, I, I realized that, you know, the things we learn, yes, they are still applicable, but you also have to learn to adapt. Because if you go to a new environment, you need to understand what that environment is like and then and manage from there. Um, when I got to, uh, I went to uh, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. When I got there, because of the IB that I had taken and my grades, they allowed me to skip two courses. Uh, I skipped the uh, chemistry, the first year chemistry, and then also uh, biology. That was very helpful because uh, what that allowed me to do was to take other courses that I found interesting. Although I'm not so sure it was such a good idea. I might, I should probably have taken them anyway because adapting to, you know, when I joined my classmates for uh, the next level of courses in those streams, I felt like I was missing something. Anyway, so <laughs> that, that was it. I know that uh, for you uh, amongst your peers, uh, there was always this widespread, widespread expectation to study medicine at the university level. How did your academic decisions unfold? Why did you make the choices that you made? And how, how did any of your earlier experiences maybe contribute to those decisions? All right. Yes, so um, the expectation when I was at school in Ghana was, okay, first, the best students were put in the science classes. And once you get into the science class, if you're a good science student, you are expected to go to medical school and become a medical doctor. And that really stems from a lack of understanding of what uh, is required to run a healthcare system. That, that's, what, that's my analysis in later years. <laughs> And so the most visible healthcare professional is a doctor. And so most families aspire to get their children into medical schools and uh, becoming doctors. And that was the same for me. You know, if I was in um, a science class, I was a good student, I was expected to go to medical school. So when I came to Atlanta Univers uh, United World College of the Atlantic, what I was expected to do was to study hard so that I would have good enough grades to get to medical school. And that was what everybody thought I was going to do. <laughs> uh, well, when the time came for me to pick my subjects, and that's another long story, I don't want to spend the whole time talking about this, but uh, director of studies at the time was uh, Colin Jenkins. I had a meeting with him and he wanted to know what I was going to do. And I didn't have a plan really. Uh, eventually I wound up going back to him and telling him that I wanted to go to the US because I had met Hallie at Harbor House who told me that there are so many universities in, in, in the United States. Why am I struggling to think of what to do? I should just go tell him I, I'll go to the US. So that's how I wound up uh, deciding to go to the US. And the counseling um, office was very, very helpful to me because they recommended some schools I could apply to. And I, so I was still thinking about medical school at the time. And I needed to take, you know, to go to the US, I was told that you don't just go immediately into medical school, you have to do a pre-med program. And I just read through all the material they gave me. And I chose bioengineering just because it sounded good. I didn't know what it was, to be honest. I had no idea what the details were, but I chose it because I felt it sounded really good. It sounded like something you do before you go to medical school. And that is how I wound up choosing bioengineering and applying to University of Pennsylvania. Yes, so that was the background. But when I got to school and we started our engineering courses, 
and everything was so exciting. I mean, first year engineering course, the uh, project, a course on a project, basically we were challenged to design technology, biomedical technology for the 21st century in those days. <laughs> and I had so much fun in that course and I, I really enjoyed what I was doing. I felt engineering was so much more exciting than what my seniors were doing in medical school. So I decided I wasn't going to medical school after all. I was happy where I was. And uh, of course, the decisions uh, that you made back then have been have been proving to be uh, the right decisions for you. Notably, uh, uh, a few years later, uh, in 2018, you were the first female recipient of the Golden Torch Award for International Academic Leadership by the National Society of Black Engineers at the 44th Annual Conference held in the USA. What did this recognition mean to you uh, in, in when comparing it to your academic uh, experiences? Um, it was a very humbling experience to be considered for such an important international award. You know, I had been working all along. I basically do what I enjoy doing, which is teaching. And I, I, I tend to be a pioneer. I'm always starting new things, doing new things. Uh, but I never thought about the awards, you know. I was doing things that I felt would benefit my society, things that I, fe I felt would benefit students around the world. So I had been involved in um, um, developing academic programs. I have collaborators at the University of Michigan. We developed an interesting academic program for students in Ghana and the University of Michigan to jointly do. Uh, I had been doing a lot of activities, developing courses, doing all sorts of activities, but these were things that I enjoyed and these were things that I felt I would, were my contributions. And so it was very humbling to be called upon for such an important award. And I was grateful to receive it, but it's challenged me to do even more, which is why I keep going. <laughs> yes. And this idea of giving back, again, came from my experiences with the United World Colleges, uh, the United World Colleges and uh, the ideals behind the United World Colleges. Congratulations and, and thank you for that. And you've mentioned some of the of the ways through which you you were a pioneer in setting up different initiatives. I know that there have been a number of them very recently, even just earlier this year. Could you tell us a, a little bit about your your most recent and professional endeavors and you know the kind of the new aspects for you and for the country? All right, so I'm currently on sabbatical leave from my regular place of work, which is the University of Ghana. Uh, so most of the time you'll find me at the University of Ghana. This is the, um, the first university in Ghana. It's the largest university in Ghana as well. Um, and uh, there I actually was part of the team that started the engineering program, all of the engineering programs there. And I was the first head of department for biomedical engineering there. Um, this year, since uh, January 1st, I have been on sabbatical leave. So I've taken one year off to join a smaller university. This university is only 10 years old. It's called the University of Health and Allied Sciences, and it's located about two and a half hours away from the capital. So it's not a big, <laughs> a big town or city or anything. But I've taken the time to come here, and the purpose is for me to help set up it's a new department and a new program. I see one of my colleagues is here, acquainted <laughs> Anyway, yes. So it's a new department uh, and it's a department of orthotics and prosthetics. This is, uh, for those who are not very familiar with it, uh, it's basically the prosthetics have to do with replacement uh, limbs, body parts, replacement body parts. Um, so artificial legs, arms, fingers, toes, <laughs> yes. And the orthotics have to do with supporting um, materials for uh, correcting orthopedic problems. So you can have braces, right? Various braces to help in uh, abnormalities and injuries and all of that. So that's the orthotics. And we need these professionals a whole lot. We have a, a, a good population, a good uh, percentage of our population that have physical disabilities. And we have not been really training enough people to be able to take care of uh, that population. And so it's something that is very much needed. We had one academic program, which is um, a, diploma, a diploma granting program, but this department that we have just started, it's only one semester old. I'm so proud of the department. Uh, 
is uh, actually granting bachelor degrees. So it's a professional program for upper system processes. Yes. So that's what I'm doing this year. Thank you for this update. Uh, in uh, 2009, you were uh, recognized, awarded the University of Ghana's Best Teacher Award for the Sciences. Congratulations. <laughs> what did this recognition mean to you? And uh, in terms of your, your passion for teaching, uh, how, how did that uh, you know, impact potentially your, your future steps? All right, so um, that award again was for something that I enjoyed doing anyway, and something I would have done anyway, even without an award. So it was something that I was on a path to do. Uh, as I explained in my earlier life, I, I saw different ways in which science was taught. And my experiences outside Ghana with UWC Atlantic, uh, with my time even at the University of Pennsylvania, and even for my postdoc at Rutgers University, I saw that there was a different way of teaching. It's the same topics, but the approach that is taken in teaching makes a whole lot of difference in the outcomes. So if a student knows that what they are learning is important and can be used to make a difference, they take the course completely differently. And, and that's exactly what I have I brought back with me when I came back to Ghana to start this biomedical engineering program. So the idea was I wanted my students, I want my students even now, to look at our environment, to think of themselves as problem solvers, and to understand that the theories and the foundation they are getting from class are applicable and are actually powerful enough to make a difference. And so that's how I approach all my courses. If you come to my class, we are trying to solve real life problems of our environment. Um, and we, we, we actually try to come up with uh, tangible solutions to some of these problems. And I think that was what was recognized <laughs> in, in awarding me that, that uh, Best Teacher Award, because I, I really do engage my students. My students don't always like it because it's a lot easier for them to just memorize things and spit them out. But if you come to my class and you memorize and spit things out, you're not going to pass. They know that by now. <laughs> and so they, are, they know they are required to work hard and, and make sure that they are becoming the problem solvers that they came to school to, to be. Thank you. I would now like to turn to your to the other side of your career, which is the quiz. Uh, so, so as I mentioned in in the introduction, you are uh, the quiz mistress and the host of uh, the national, uh, sorry, of the Ghana National Science and Mathematics Quiz TV program for senior high schools. Uh, I uh, would love to find out more about how you transfer your teaching experience and expertise into this environment and uh, how, what are your, your takeaways from, from fulfilling that role? Uh, how, how do you, do you what, what have the experiences been like? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, most people in Ghana know me for this uh, program. It has been running since 1993. But I joined the team in 2006, and I have been the host and quiz mistress of the Ghana National Science and Math Quiz. Uh, basically, I don't know what it's like in other countries, but I, I suspect it's similar. Many people think the sciences and the mathematics uh, subjects are a lot more difficult than other subjects. And they try to avoid it. Mathematics is like a nightmare for many people. They don't even want to think about it. And it's basically because of the way it's taught in the schools. The foundation that you get will determine whether you love the subject or not. And we haven't, we had not been doing too well. We still have issues. So um, on this program, basically, the best way for me to explain to show a video, I think I have a video which I will share after I finish talking. But um, I, I can't describe it. So what happens for a month every year in Ghana, we have a national competition. So even before this uh, month long uh, competition, we have qualifiers that happen in the region. So in fact, all year round, there's some science activity going on in Ghana and it's targeted towards high school students. So what they do is they prepare very well. At the end of their, their careers as uh, science students, they set an exam, a West African uh, exam that they all set. But we take the same syllabus and we ask questions, physics, chemistry, biology, and mathematics. And we ask them to, uh, <laughs> to, to answer these questions. Sometimes 10 seconds you have to come up with an answer. 
And so they think very fast, they work very fast, and they study really hard in order to be able to be on their school teams. And what works is also, as I mentioned, most people in Ghana attend these boarding schools. So the schools have taken this very seriously. The old students, the alumni take it very seriously. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a whole, the, the whole of Ghana comes to a stop during the month of the national competition. And the purpose, my role in there is to try and make um, science and math appealing, you know, to popularize it, to demystify it, to get rid of the idea that it's so hard and it's only serious people. And if you are not in a certain kind of category, you cannot do these subjects. I, I want everyone to feel that they belong and they can, they can, they can do science and math, yes. Thank you, and I know you have, have a following on, on, on social media, so I think that answers for making science much more appealing to many young people. And kind of staying on the topic of young people and maybe addressing this more uh, towards our current students or uh, recent graduates who are just, you know, beginning the, their careers. Uh, I heard you say in uh, one of your uh, vi video interviews that in uh, in the society there's currently zero t tolerance for failure and you com commented there is no patience for experimentation but we are still nonetheless interested in solutions uh, how uh, does this pressure you know uh, Im might impact young people and what words ad of advice would you have for for those uh, young graduates or recent graduates uh, who are in the process of transitioning to higher education. All right. So this is a very exciting time for you. If you're a young person in that position, you know, before you enter university, this is an excellent time. Don't, don't, don't take the opportunities you get lightly. You know, if you are at a UWC right now and you are listening to me, you are so privileged. You are so, I mean, I don't know how to describe that experience you are getting, but what happens with you afterwards depends on how much effort you put into everything. And so take the opportunity as it has come to you. Use this opportunity to make your mistakes. Of course, there are different types of mistakes, right? So we have the, the reversible mistakes and you have the irreversible ones. I'm hoping as a parent, I always look for uh, ir to avoid the irreversible ones, but to go for the reversible mistakes. It's in school that you can experiment. That's one of the things that I, I learned. If you haven't found yourself yet, you don't know where you're going to make your contribution to, to the universe. <laughs> this is a time to experiment and find out the things that you love to do. It's very difficult to excel when you, don't, you are not passionate about what you're doing. This is a time to experiment, find out what you are passionate about, decide where you're going to make your impact, and then go for it. Look for help. I mean, mentorship is extremely important to me as well. That's one of the things that I promote, mentorship. Find someone who will give you good advice, who will allow you not to be too overwhelming, but will allow you to explore in a safe way. And go ahead, explore, do all the things you need to do. Enjoy it, enjoy the journey. Thank you so much, Elsie. Before we turn to all our attendees for questions, and I can see uh, that we've had some comments in the chat. I know that Elsie has prepared uh, some more information about her family and about her uh, more recent involvement as well. So I am uh, going to um, share uh, the presentation now and uh, Elsie, uh, over to you for, for comments for us. Okay. So I would like to say that um, I would like to say that this uh, set of slides was uh, prepared by my daughters. My two daughters did this for me. I told them I want to tell a story about my life. They they were free to go and pick whatever they wanted to show, just as long as it made some sense. And this is what they were able to do for me. So I'm grateful, and Davis. If you are on there, thank you very much. And Maya, thank you very very much. Okay, so this first slide is my early days. <laughs> the one standing there, that's me. And this was, I was 10 years old, a year, or just a, a year and a bit more later, I would, have, I would go to uh, boarding school. So this is what I looked like in those days. Uh, the one in the middle is my siblings. I have my brother, Kofi, who is right next to me. I'm the one in the back, the tallest one in the back. And that's my brother, Kofi, and then my sister, Obaya, Belinda. Uh, 
all the way to the left. And then my youngest brother is in front and the others are family friends. So that's what I looked like in those days before I went to uh, secondary school, high school. Yes, and then on the right, that's my mom and with the four of us. Okay, this picture on the left is a, a bit out of place because that's actually me when I was in um, university, my second year of university, the one with me certain my arms crossed. <laughs> so that's a bit out of place. But this uh, picture, the black and white picture is a picture of my first year class. <laughs> that's my first year class. Uh, my first, my classmates from a Brigal secondary school when we first got there. So I'm the one right in the middle next to the young lady with a skirt and the arm in the skirt. Yes, so next to that person, the white outfit, that, that's me. And that's what I look like when I first went to secondary school. Very small and tiny. <laughs> All right. Yes, yeah, so if you can go to the next one. Okay, so these are pictures from UWC Atlantic. The first one was the 25th anniversary of AC. Uh, a book was, uh, we had a book, you know, telling about the school with a lot of pictures and I was actually on the cover. That, that's, that's my picture that's on the cover of that book. And uh, it was an interesting, it was an interesting time. It reminds me a lot about what happened when I was there. The one in the middle was, um, oh yes, this one, uh, I had the opportunity to travel to France, we went to Ile d'Orléans as part of the French class. We went to live with the um, oyster farmers. They didn't speak any English. I was forced to speak bad French for two weeks. <laughs> but I, I really, I really appreciated that opportunity. It made a huge difference in my life. And then um, the one on the right, the, the far right, that is me in the yearbook. That's my yearbook picture <laughs> from 1988, yes. So that's me in 1988. All right, so these pictures are from university. And these are some of the good friends that I had in university. The one with me uh, and the other lady, that's uh, Mona. Mona Yu was in my bioengineering uh, class. I, oh, <laughs> so many memories. And then the one on the right is um, a picture with my friends, Helen. Helen is now a professor at Columbia University. And then Lenu, Lenu is in Denmark now, but we still talk. We still talk every week on Sundays. We have our, our chats. So it's been nice. Yes. So these were my good friends from my uh, university. All right. <laughs> so this is me at the University of Ghana. Um, Magda, you mentioned the award for the best teacher. That the one on the left with me standing in front, that was when my citation was being read in 2010. And if you look in the back, you will find Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan is uh, the late Kofi Annan, who was a chancellor of the University of Ghana at the time. And it was such a pleasure to, to meet and work with him at the University of Ghana. Yes. And then on the right is just me, official university <laughs> activity. Oh, please, you can move on to the next one. Uh -huh. So, yes, these are my children, my pride and joy. Yes. <laughs> so, um, this picture, I think, is from 2006. 2006. So, I have two daughters. The eldest is Maya, and then there's Davis. Those are the two that helped me with the slide. They take the photos. And then uh, the youngest is uh, Augustus Kupi. Yes. And you can see the more recent picture on the right. Yes. Oh, <laughs> so thank you, Maya and Davis. All right, so I mentioned to you that uh, there's no way I can actually describe the National Science and Math Quiz. If you don't see it for yourself, you will not believe any description I give you. So I asked, I, again, I asked Maya and Davis to put something together. They have edited a, a documentary from a BBC on the program and they put in what they find interesting and I'm sure you will see why they find those interesting. So I have a short video to share with you about what the program is about. My name is Elsie Fakofman and I'm honored to be your quiz mistress. We are working very hard towards the semi-finals. We've been praying about it. We've been preparing very hard for it. And we are hoping to qualify for the finals. 
I really wanted to be a part of it too and actually engage myself in it and progress in life. The Science and Math quiz has a lot in it for um, students who really want to improve their abilities. It has, it has so many lessons to teach you about composure, about how you approach people, about so many things. And I think it's a very great learning opportunity for anybody. Solve the equation. X plus three over X is equal to four. I don't know. X is equal to one or three. Yes. At dance in your high school. You do mention variety and for that I give you two points. But many of the things you have there are actually quite seriously flawed. Just imagine human beings, we are sexually reproducing, right? How can you say uh, individuals and offsprings from sexually reproducing organisms are resistant to disease? Are we resistant to disease? New species <laughs> of organisms are formed from generation to another. I hope my next generation is the same species as me. <laughs> Ladies, how are you? Good. You know my tympanic membrane is almost destroyed. <laughs> Dion, the bones of the middle ear amplify and transmit the sound waves into the, into the inner ear so that it can be detected by the brain. Yes. By the way, the bones of my middle ear, my tympanic membrane, all of those suffering from the frequency of the sound you are making. <laughs> I'm going to finish reading the clues, then all of you people making the noise, you will answer it. <laughs> For you. I am the study of genetic variation within and among populations and the evolutionary factors that explain this variation. So who am I? Yes. You are right. I guess I was born in the country of pyramids. I am manufactured on industrial scale in all the industrialized world. Yes, Prisla. And it's three. You are right. It's been a very long time for my school. Um, not only I, but the whole team right now, I feel relieved of all the stress and everything that we've gone through. I feel very excited about it. I feel that um, we've been able to put our school out there. We've been able to regain what St. Peter's had. I feel that it's a blessing for all of us. Thank you so much for taking us on this journey. <laughs> meet your family, meet your your activities, and all that you've been been doing.
fantastic congratulations thank you Magda that we have uh, some comments and questions in the chat. So I'll now turn over to those of you who wanted to ask us questions. Uh, Matilda, you are the first one, please. Would you like to unmute yourself? Yes, hello, everybody. Hello, Elsie. Hi, Matilda. I found it really exciting, exciting. I'm not so much for math, but uh, I think <laughs> I would really be enthusiastic about learning math with you. Well, anyway, um, I've been at uh, AC long before you uh, in, in uh, the year 77 to 79. And I'm a French citizen, so I'm glad that you went to France and you appreciate it. Uh, and I'm living in Germany, actually, the last 42 years since I left uh, the wow. college. I was, I, I was facing a lot of racism and I'm still facing a lot of racism in this country. And I'm a social worker and activist and that's why I want to ask you, how did you deal with racism uh, in, in the US and uh, at the college, oh, uh, sorry, at the, the high school? And did you get involved into activism or something like that? All right. Thank you, Matilda. That's an interesting question indeed. Uh, yes, you know, so I had been brought up in Ghana where uh, I was always majority. <laughs> yes. I was always the majority. Uh, I went to <laughs> UWC Atlantic, where everybody was so idealistic, wanted to learn about everyone else. Everyone was nice to each other. This, that was the experience I got. I didn't really face yes. much racism yes. or any racism that I can remember at UWC Atlantic. So yes, it was in the US that I began to realize that <laughs> there was something like this. But the thing is, you know, I went there for a purpose. I always kept reminding myself, I am here for a purpose. I, maybe it's also because I knew I had a choice. <laughs> I knew I would eventually leave and go back. So I was much more tolerant of certain things than I would have been if I knew I was stuck there. And so, um, yes, I, I did experience some of it. And I can tell you some stories. But it was not something that was going to derail me. I, I was too determined to succeed in what I went there to do. Good. Thank you so much. And all the best for you and your family. Thank you. It was really nice uh, getting Thank to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Thank Jackman, you. you have a question. Would you like to unmute yourself? Yes. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. It's Jacqueline Bafo here. Um, Professor Kaufman, I've got a, a, a little question for you. So I think you spoke about um, ensuring you've got mentorship or you, you have a mentor. Um, would you be able to share with us some of the you know, um, critical advice or um, important advice that you were provided um, by many of your you know, mentors around the world whilst you were going through um, college and university and also at the moment? All right. Yes. Yeah, so I'm very interested in mentorship. Jacqueline, thank you for that question. And uh, I do mentor a lot of a lot of people, but that's also because I have benefited from mentorship myself and I feel I should give back. Yes, my mentors really, I've had many mentors over the years. I have not kept one particular mentor. There were some that I observed from a distance. So it wasn't even interaction, personal interactions with the person, but just observing the way the person conducted themselves or the way in which they approached problems and difficulties was a, a source of uh, advice to me and a source of encouragement to me. And then there were those who actually spoke to me. I have had certain difficulties. So in difficult times, I usually tend to find somebody to speak to. I don't keep things to myself and just uh, dwell in my difficulties alone. I feel like if I share my difficulties, somebody may have had similar experiences. So usually for some, it's sharing what experiences they have had in their life and what difficulties they faced and how they address those difficulties. That gives me ideas about how I may tackle mine. So different relationships with the very different mentors that I have had in my past. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's really inspiring. 
And um, Elsie, I have a question uh, that uh, has come that I've noticed uh, watching, you know, a number of uh, video interviews that you've given, and as well as what we've just uh, seen in terms of the quiz. I notice your uh, uh, noticeable and, and quite a wide range of outfits uh, and your passion for, for fashion, which uh, in, in an interesting way complements your, your passion for bioengineering as well, of course. I would love to find out more uh, what 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 is the significance and meaning of of the items that you choose to wear all right so when you see me you see the fabric it's mainly the fabric that is so colorful right so first is the fabric uh the fabric is since 2007 uh it has been sponsored by a company a fabric company in ghana it's known as gtp so they sponsor and what they do is they provide one piece of cloth for every contest that I do. So what, <laughs> what they do then is once they provide the fabric, there are people who actually dressmakers who make the outfits. And of course I had to approve because I can't be seen in just anything. And you'd be amazed to find out that there are some of our audiences, some members of the audience and some who even watch at home and on, on social media who are watching just to see what I'm wearing. So it's all part of the, the experience of involving everybody. <laughs> so if you are not interested in science, but you're interested in my outfits, at least come and, and watch. Hopefully you will learn some science as part of, of the experience as well. So I am wearing the outfits that are sponsored by uh, uh, GTP. And, and that's why I, I look so colorful. Yes. They're all beautiful. They're, Thank they're, you. They're... Uh, I, By the I, way, I donate. I donate most of them because I mean, what would I do with so many outfits? There's so many contests and so many outfits. So at the end, uh, when I finish, I donate most of it. I keep a few that I like, and the rest I donate all. I am sure that the new owners also enjoy them greatly. <laughs> uh, I, I see there is a question from Doris. Doris, I'm happy to read out the question, but I just wanted to check in case you wanted to ask it yourself. If so. Please feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, I am not seeing. Yes, hello, I'm here. Yes. Hello, Dr. Elsie, good to get in touch with you. Hello, I, Doris. Yes, my question is, uh, what practical steps can any school or organization take to encourage children to enjoy and participate in STEM subjects, especially in areas where they are less funded and less privileged? Okay, so there are so many suggestions that I can make, but first thing is the interest itself. How do you generate interest? If the students don't understand that science can actually change the world, that, they, that what they are learning can be used to uh, solve problems, they are not going to be interested. So if you present it in a way that is uh, it's a classroom subject, it's time to do math, let's sit down and do math, and you don't relate it to their reality, their lives, they are not going to be interested. The other thing is to also understand the people you are trying to reach. What do they find exciting? So we've talked about the fashion, for example. If somebody is interested in fashion, and because of the interest in fashion, you can engage them, use that. So find out the interests of the people that you are trying to reach. And then it's not everything that requires so much funding. I'm working with a group right now, it's known as the Practical Education Network. What they are targeting is actually teachers, teachers who teach the STEM subjects. And what they do is to use things that are readily available so that you don't have to spend so much to try and get complicated equipment in order to introduce science to someone. So using what is available to you, but of course that takes a little bit of help, which is why this group I'm working with has developed interesting ways of actually getting the teachers themselves to want to use uh, these methods of teaching. So these are some suggestions that I can make. We can talk about it all day, but these are some suggestions that I have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much for uh, all your uh, comments and questions. And thank you to Elsie for, for this lovely conversation. Uh, I am just looking ho to hopefully not have missed any uh, comments. Um, I, I've, I've, I have seen a couple comments coming through 
uh, about uh, John, who is in the audience with us today, and thanks to whom I understand a number of students have skipped uh, the first year of university chemistry. Uh, yes. So just a word of recognition to, uh, to uh, John, and uh, I can, I'm reading in the chat that you are the, one of the best teachers uh, some of our attendees have ever had. So thank you. <laughs> And, and, and thank you very much to everyone who is with us here today. I hope you enjoyed this event. If you are interested in, in hearing more from other alumni and finding out more about UWC Atlantic as it was before and as it is today, uh, we have a few events coming uh, up later this spring. So do look out for emails from us. We hope to see you again soon. In the meantime, Thank you so much, Elsie, for this fantastic talk and presentation. It was delightful to hear you talk about your journey and about all that you've been doing to uh, increase the uh, popularity of science in Ghana and in the world. We are very grateful and uh, we hope to, uh, for you to continue this fantastic work with best wishes. Thank you. Thank you so very much for having me Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, Magda, I enjoy chatting with you. <laughs> thank you. For those of you who uh, would like to comment on uh, today's event, we've posted, my colleague Yuan posted the link to our feedback form. So do let us know what your comments are and what you would like to hear about in the future. Thank you, everyone.